I am calling this video a how I did it video rather than a how to video um, but I guess it's kind of the same thing but I'm going to show you the steps it takes to make a big drawing like this uh, first off this is done in marker um, black ink on a, it's a 20 by 28 inch image on a 24 by 30 inch piece of paper and the first thing you're going to need to make one of these is a big piece of paper like this and this right here is the type of paper I used it's a Blick Fabriano 140 pound cold press watercolor paper now the first thing I have to tell you is this isn't particularly good paper for watercolor. Uh, it's a student grade paper, but it is archival, which means it's not going to turn yellow and fall apart in a few years. A lot of student grade papers are not archival because you're supposed to throw your student work out after, you know, a few years. But um, a real good watercolor paper uh, will cost a like I said, I think, I think this, sh this pack of 10 cost me 10 or $15. And you can pay that for a single sheet of good watercolor paper this size. Uh, and I do use good watercolor paper this size on occasion. But for this particular thing, this, this paper is excellent. Why it's bad for watercolor is that it, um, it doesn't take a lot of roughing up. Um, a good watercolor paper, you can throw watercolor down on it. Uh, scrub on it, throw some water, water, watercolor paper down on it, and the fibers are all really will survive. The, you know, it's tough to rough up a good watercolor paper. You can do a lot to it, and it'll still be nice and the surface workable. This surface isn't that workable. Um, as a matter of fact, when I draw with a pencil on this, I have a hard time erasing the pencil from it. It's like the fibers just kind of grab on to that pencil and never let it go. But for something like this, where I'm putting down one black mark and it doesn't have to go anywhere and I don't have to rework the surface and I don't have to go back in. I'm not going in with water and color. That's one of, one of the reasons I'm using marker on this is because marker is dry instantly. Um, as opposed to a watercolor, which will, you know, like I said, I'm a little iffy with this paper and watercolor. I love it for this. Now, the first thing you need when making a large drawing is a drawing. Uh, now, I like to start from, this is my sketchbook where I do spontaneous ink drawings. So I just draw a little box, then draw a little picture in the box, basically. Um, there's purple. Sometimes I like to draw on a purple marker. I, I like these sign pens for this type of drawing because they give you an easy one weight. There's a, I also refill this particular one with India ink and use it so it makes a more permanent line. Just a Pentel sign pen. They make a nice, even, consistent line, which is what I, since these are just line, they're just simple line drawings. I'm not looking for anything fancy. I'm not looking for line weight. I'm not looking for placement of uh, blacks and whites. I'm just doing some little drawing, just getting ideas down. Um, and I try to clear my mind and not think about what to draw, but just kind of make drawings. That's how I'm able to get these uh, images that uh, I might otherwise, I might not, my conscious mind might not otherwise make. They're just kind of a little surrealist automatic drawing method where you're drawing from the scribbles in your brain. You're making faces in clouds, that sort of thing. So I do, see this, this is a uh, book number 15. I do about one of these a year. Prefabricate, I name them randomly too by pointing my finger in the dictionary. And so what I do, and after I do one of these little drawings, I scan in the page so that if I want, if I, as I'm flipping through, if I say, uh, let's see, where's one that catches my eye? 
Hmm. Oh, I like that one. I like that one right there. Okay, that's book 15, page 58. So then I can just go to my computer, open up the file of book 15, page 58, and bam, I have already got it there, ready to go. I don't have to, you know, scan it in at the moment or anything like that. Um, so, like I said, I, it, I wish I could find the original little drawing that I made into this big one, but uh, I have no idea which book it came from. I didn't note it. Oftentimes I'll just like, I'll just take one of these, make it into a drawing, it'll sit there for a while until I make something out of it so I have a uh, bunch of small drawings, let's see, sitting around. These are all just drawings I did that I never made into anything larger. So, someday, I'll pull them out and do something with them, but that, that's why I don't know exactly what page this drawing is from. It's because I, I, I do a bunch of them. They don't all get worked up into something larger. But now, let me show you that drawing itself. All right, here you go. This is the six by nine inch drawing that I took from some little sketch in one of these books. And you can see the blue line on there is actually the original sketch. Because what I do is I print out on this six by nine paper, I print out the original drawing in blue line. And then I take a pencil and uh, work right over the blue, li blue line using it as an underdrawing. Um, and what pencil I usually use, I sometimes use a uh, sketch, a uh, general sketch pencil, but I wouldn't use this. This I'll use if I have no drawing to work from. Uh, if I'm just drawing out of my mind at the moment, large, I'll use one of these. So I didn't actually use this one on this drawing. I used a Faber-Castell 4B pencil. I like the softer pencils because I don't have to erase because I've got my underdrawing in blue. And I just like the soft pencil. And you can see here, this is an old click eraser. No eraser in it anymore, but I use it as an extender for the pencil. That way... I can grab it anywhere I want, and I can use the pencil even when it gets really tiny because it'll have this extender on the end of it. That's a neat little tip if you want to keep your pencil length uh, long and uh, don't want to work with a real tiny pencil, which I hate working with a real tiny pencil, but don't want to throw away your pencil once it gets halfway down. Find something like an old click eraser. This is like a, you know, a dollar twenty-nine click eraser from uh, the local, you know, five and dime or pharmacy. I mean, this is a school supply sort of thing. So try that if you uh looking to make your pencil longer. Then the other thing I got is a mechanical pencil. I go in there for some smaller details at the end. I'm not even, yeah, not even sure if I, I don't always use the mechanical pencil. Sometimes the um, wood pencil is enough. Um, but sometimes I want to go in there with smaller details and I use a mechanical pencil. And often I go from this 6x9 size to a uh, 9x12 size. Here, let me just, I didn't do it for this one. But I'll, I'll go to a 9x12 size if I want more detail in the drawing. So sometimes I stop at 6x9. Sometimes I go from, I do 6x9 and then go up to 9 by 12, sometimes I start at 9 by 12, sometimes 11 by 14. But usually, but, but for, uh, I knew I was going to be making a big drawing out of this, so this was enough detail for me to start the big drawing. So I stopped at this, it would be pointless to go to 9 by 12, since this was going to be such a large drawing, I may as well just go to the large size right away. And that's what I did. Now... How do we get that small drawing onto this big drawing? And the way that I do that is I scan in the smaller drawing and then I blow it up on the computer and print it out on, you see here that there's four separate sheets of 11 by 17 paper. I have a printer that prints at 11 by 17, so I could, you know, with four sheets, just tape it together, you know, you know this, is, this is temporary, so there's no need to uh, go all crazy with it. 
And there's actually a few different ways to get it up. Like if it was canvas, I'd grid it up. That's a whole other method I'll have to show you sometime. But with this, I've got my copy enlarged, dropped right on top. And then I get some graphite paper. There's some legacy 50s industrial design for you. I, this is an, an old tool that artists have been using for a long, long time. And they still make it. And all it is, is a sheet of paper that on one side, that side is covered in graphite, which is your pencil lead that's not really lead, it's graphite. So that you take your graphite paper with the graphite side towards the drawing, you put it in between Put it in between the paper and the drawing and then this is where I use an H pencil because a harder pencil helps. Then you just draw along your lines and that transfers whatever this pencil makes onto a blank sheet of paper. It does a pretty poor job of it too because the lines are often light and when you're just kind of in this paper the paper and the drawing paper is really rough so when you're kind of drawing drawing over it just gives you a little little bit of a line so when you pull this off it's pretty ugly you that it, but that's okay because i'm redrawing the whole thing in ink um so don't try to get it too pretty when you're just transferring with graphite paper all you're doing is you want a nice representation of it that you can work with if you know if the line the line's not going to be perfectly swept along and curved i'm going to do that later when i draw it so that's one of the that's one of the things you can use graphite paper saves you from trying to redraw the same thing over at a bigger size and it never comes out exactly the same unless you use a grid but that's a whole other story but graphite paper i'm a big believer in using whatever you got um i love art supplies i love different tools i've collected them over my lifetime i love using different things but if you don't have something don't let it stop you from doing something so i could i could do this whole drawing with one brush if i wanted it wouldn't come out exactly like this but i could and that's how i do a lot of my smaller drawings and I, in the beginning of doing larger drawings like this, I tried doing the whole thing with a brush and I could, but it was kind of the same as my smaller ones. I didn't, uh, I wasn't overly fond of it. So that's when I decided to do these with uh, markers. And let's see here. For this, I use Copic markers. Uh, I've actually done a couple of them in Shin Han markers, but this is the best thing about Copic markers, refills. Because this one refill costs about the same as one of these markers and refills it 10 times. So you'd be crazy to use up this marker and then throw it out when you can just put more ink in it. Um, so that's why I like the Copic markers, the refills, and I, as you can see in this little marker wallet, I have a few of them. I don't really use these smaller ones very much, but I use, and I, oh, I, this is a big wide one that I pretty much only use, let's see, for filling in blacks. So you can see me use this in one of my earlier live drawing videos when I did the large live drawing to uh, music, but I almost only use that for filling in large areas of blacks. Just makes that go a little faster. And then we've got um, a sort of specialty marker. One of the good things about these Copic markers is too, the tips of them are replaceable. You can also get calligraphy tips for them. Get that against my shirt. That's just a flat calligraphy tip. And I've got two different, for some reason you can't buy these as regular markers, but you can buy a regular marker and replace the tips with these calligraphy tips. And um, that's what gets me these lines here that are a certain width. And then the normal one I use is one side is the fine tip. 
and one side is the chisel tip. And I've used this chisel tip on most of this against an edge, but you can see it gets really chewed up there. That, that chisel tip has seen better days, but um, it's replaceable. This one isn't used anymore. Throw that chisel tip out, stick another chisel tip in. That's why I love these Copic markers. It it's all seems to be replaceable. And then the other one I use is a brush marker. It's a rubber brush. It's not a real brush, but it imitates a brush. And I use that on certain freehand areas like the ear around here and these marks down in here. And um, these little, I have some little tick marks on this sort of collar here that I use the brush for. So anything where I just, just want to go freehand, I usually use the brush. And on the other side of the brush is another smaller chisel tip that I don't use as much except when I need to, you know? Sometimes you just need a smaller chisel tip line and I've used that for that. So that's, that's, that's mostly, that's, and that, that's mostly what you, you know, and if you only have one of these markers, only use one of these markers, but make sure you get the refill for it because that's what makes these go so long. So those are the uh, basic marker tools I use for these. Next, I'm going to show you the rather wide variety of edges, curved edges that I use for uh, making all these, because you only need one straight edge. Um, but you need all, all sorts of French curves and uh, circle templates and ellipse templates to make to make other stuff. If you don't got them, don't you you know use whatever you got. I would say, but over the, like I said, I've I've been collecting these things, these art supplies for 25 years now. So I've got a wide variety of them, and some are I even got just recently. So we'll start with the basic stuff: a triangle. This is my straight edge that I use. But the interesting thing about this is inside the triangle is a grid. Now that comes in really handy for when I want lines just a certain width apart. So I want all my lines a quarter inch apart. I move a quarter inch on the grid, line that up with a line I just drew and keep shifting that across until I have like I think I made all these lines with that. They're like an inch and a quarter apart. So I drew that line, an inch and a quarter, drew the next line. And all these tiny ones, I'll have to show you what I made those with in a little while. But you're going to need a straight edge. Cheap. You can use a ruler. Use a ruler for a straight edge or you can use a triangle. I use both sometimes. But for this, it's that grid that uh, gets things going for me. And then... The other basics, French curve and ellipse te and circle templates. We have ellipse templates in the back too. I'll show you those. French curve, basic. If a lot of a lot of your you know your arts and crafts stores have really bad French curves these days. I notice. So look around because I bought some at uh, AC Moore a few years ago, and if you ran your hand along this curve right here, you'd feel burrs, and you can't draw a good curve with when it's got burrs in it. But this one I think I got from uh, a Dick Blick, which has real fine art supply stores, and they had some nice French curves. So uh, keep your eye out when you're buying French curves. Feel before you buy them, feel the edge. See if the if, if the edge isn't even and has burrs in it. Don't get it. Then we've got circle templates. You want to make a circle? Put the template up there. Draw inside the template with a marker. You got a circle. Of course, find, having the right size circle is always the problem with any circle template. So I've got smaller one and bigger one. And you never have a big enough circle template for the circles you draw. Sometimes you got to use a compass. Sometimes you just got to uh, improvise and use a jar lid. I've used all sorts of things to draw circles, but you need a circle. Actually, you said, I've, I once had a collection of before I got this of jar lids this size, all these different sizes, and used that. So, like I said, don't let not having something stop you. Just use whatever you got. Okay, and along with the circle templates, we have ellipse templates. These are your circles that are at an angle. Because you often need, you know, curves and ellipses not everything's a perfect circle and these you could always get a lot of stuff like this is computers have made obsolete and they're a little harder to find but you can still find them 
And I have a set, uh, I started with a set of four different sizes of these. This is what, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, I think 60 degrees and 15 degrees within the four set. And then whenever I saw a new one, 55 degrees, 50 degrees, I'd buy it and add it to my collection. So I got about a half dozen of these. Uh, I probably haven't bought a new one of this particular type since the 90s, since uh, I got them all uh, then. Um, but another thing I collected, ellipse template wise, are these giant ellipses. Now these are big. I think this was originally a set of four, but I found them into, I can remember, I can remember prowling the prowling the halls of pearl paint looking for ellipse templates in like 1992. Me and a whole bunch of other my friends who were new to the art world and didn't have all our art supplies and used ellipse templates. But these ones are wonderful. They make nice big, big ellipses, big curves, you know. Sometimes you don't even need a whole ellipse. You need a piece of an ellipse, so you go with them. And a couple of new things that I are in here. This just last year, the year these these are look at giant French curve. I only got this recently. I, I can't remember if I bought it last year, or the year before, but it's it, it's a newer one. It's wonderful, you know. In case I need a really large curve, as I do on these, I put this wherever I need it. Draw draw against the edge. By the way, you also have to clean these a lot if you're using them with a marker, because the marker gets right on the edge and you can make a mess of things. So keep a rag and some Windex around. And then the final French, big old French curve I got is this one, a nice tight spiral curve. Check that out, neat. Just, uh, we're doing tight curves because you don't always get long tight curves with the smaller templates um, I just bought I bought this one the same time I got that other big one last last year the year before I can't remember they're new so I'm always on the lookout for stuff uh, but I didn't let not having those two stop me from doing any drawings before I had them so remember use what use whatever you got Okay, now I'm going to show you a couple of helpful odds and ends when it comes to making big curves that uh, are pretty neat, but not not all that common. And the first is, this is called the adjustable ship's curve, 24 inches. Um, AccuArc adjustable curves. I think I found these at a site called MrArt.com. It was the only place that had them. I've, I've, I've known people who had these before, but I never got one up until about 10 years ago. And it's just wonderful because you can actually, I needed it for this right here, this big curve where a little tricky to use because you gotta hold one end with your elbow and match up the curve there and then draw along it so it can be tricky to use when you make it when you've got it curved that much but oh boy does it make large curves easier because you're never going to get never going to get a circle template quite that so, uh, that big so this works out pretty well for though let me let me show you a bad adjustable curve this is the bane of all art students existences because it is it's just an, it's just a waste of money and annoying i actually bought this in 1984 when I was going away to college and it's one of those things that was on the art supply lists so I got and you know everybody else at freshman in art school had one and it's just useless it's a piece of lead in this plastic and it just you can never you can never get a good clean curve with it if you look at the curve I mean look at it well this one's a little more broken than most but even still you just can't get a good clean curve on that edge. It's always it's always a mess. All, all it's good for is we used to have fights with them, of course, and make make the shape of your hand by going like that. It's ah, don't ever get one of these. Look for one of these. That is uh, the lesson I'm giving you right now because this actually works. The next thing I have is another oddity of when it comes to curves, and it's another AccuArc thing. I don't, uh, 
I think you can get these at MrArt.com. I'm not even sure, but a friend of mine, hello Michelle, got me this. I think she found it at a secondhand store. As you can see, it's, it's, it's old. It's another remnant of 1950s design here. All this uh, stuff. So this, this isn't, uh, this isn't a new, I don't know how many of these are still left out there, but it's uh, AccuArc ruler. It's one of these, uh, it's pretty cool because you undo this and you can make these curve. Perfect symmetrical curves. Because there's one thing, and, and very large, because there's one thing about the um, French curves is the curves aren't symmetrical. They're only symmetrical for short distances. So if you need a long distance symmetrical curve and you don't want to be holding, trying to hold that uh, flexible ship's curve in place. This works really well. I, uh, I've used this quite a bit. It's a little tricky with the spring and you don't want to break it because it's, it's just, pl that's just a plastic edge there. That's, so it's only the flexibility of the plastic that keeps it from breaking. And I've read a little bit about these and this can get stiff and brittle and break on you, but this one's still fine. Um, my friend Michelle gave it to me this summer and I've been using it ever since, but like I said, I'm a collector of tools, but you don't let not having tools stop you. You just add new ones to your collection and find new ways to use them. The final piece of equipment I want to show you here that I use to make this drawing is my half hatching machine. Now, I'm the only one I know who has one of these. That's how much of an art supply geek I am. I probably bought this in, back in the early 90s too, but it's, ju it's just for making parallel lines. It's a little ruler that attaches to this little arm. And you line it up with your paper. Let's see, we'll line it up with the edge there. You put your, push on the little thumbtack ends. And now, right here is a little dial you turn that's anywhere between one and five millimeters. So now every time I press this little thumb button here, it moves over exactly four, well, three and a half millimeters I have it set for. So if I want to make uh, some nice parallel lines, it's just a matter of and this, once again, is something you can do just by measuring out the lines if you want, or with that gridded rule, gridded triangle that I have can do something like this. But this is just so neat and precise that it's excellent for making these little parallel lines. So a lot of the small parallel lines that I make in these large drawings are made with this. Once again, this is nothing you really need to make anything you can make it without it like i said use what you got but it's something i always liked and here let's flip it this way and we can make perfect little crosshatch boxes hold on let me see if i can find that top edge there we go make a line push take a look at that H-A-F-F -F hatching machine. Not even sure where you can get one of these these days. Probably eBay. I don't even know where I got this one in 1990 whatever. Probably out of a catalog. It was before the age of the internet. But that's a neat little, neat little device that I use all the time. Um, now let me pull this camera off the tripod and give you a closer look at the drawing. All right, here we go. Let's go in for a look. There are the eyes. You can see these little marks are all freehand, but these are done with a French curve or of some sort. All these little marks are freehand, but of course the circle template is made in there. I like mixing up freehand with the templates because uh, you don't want something to look too perfect. You don't want something to look too imperfect. This around here, I believe, was this is all probably the, the brush end um, freehand. The clouds, of course, are all freehand because there's no need to use a 
any kind of template or French curve on a cloud. And this, let's see, this, the, all these lines with that little half drawing machine, half drawing machine, because you can see how nicely spaced they are. What was interesting too is these lines right here, I used the half drawing machine, but I tried attaching one of my French curves to it. And a curved edge on that machine doesn't quite make the sort of perfect, you know, because the, the, the angle of the curve is changed as it drops down because depending on which side of the edge you're on. So it's not quite perfect uh, um, marks there, but that's okay. I like the way that came out. And, and it's funny is because going one side came out a little more perfect than the other side. But once again, that's... Uh, that's part of what I like about some mixing up hand-drawn stuff with machine kind of edge stuff is that you can get things can play off one another. And here is this with this texture in here is all done with the, the brush end of the pen, just kind of making little little brush marks until I uh, faded it into black there. And here is the pen end of one of the markers here on these. Uh, little spirals once again imperfect spirals just a little pattern different shapes and different sizes um nothing perfect about these spirals but they make a nice visual pattern as opposed to uh these perfect that was done with the calligraphy end of the pen and the hoff machine just makes beautiful nice little parallel lines there so there you go up oh, what's the end what's the name of this one let's see because I, I, na I name these randomly. Grand Facade. I actually name it at the sketch stage, just so I can keep track of everything and find it. But, uh, so there you go. There's a look at uh, how I did it.